Nina McCreeth, one of the owners of the Flying Dragon Bookshop here on Bayview Avenue in Toronto. And here's Vicki, my manager. Hello. We've been open for six years and our favorite thing to do really is to talk about books to, our, to each other, to the customers, and anybody else who will listen <laughs> to all the books that we have loved reading. So we particularly love Kate Morton's books and I understand that she has a new book coming out in October of 2010. A nice Halloween treat. So we can hardly wait. Which one did you like better, would you say? Um, I think that My Heart Belongs to the House at Riverton, just because it was the first time that I had discovered her. It was her debut novel, and it really captured me right away and stuck with me to the very, very end. I, I have to say that I think I like them both, and I, now that we're, we have them both here, I think there were a couple of themes that were common to both of the books, don't you think? Yes, definitely. Certainly the idea of secrets in families was a big theme, and I wonder if Kate Morton herself came from a family that had any kind of background secrets, because that made the book so suspenseful and real page-turners, both of them, I think. There were a lot of sort of powerful matriarchs in both of them, some working for better, some working for worse, but they tended to have sort of the plot turned on sort of things that mothers had done in the past or were doing, or sort of how those sort of behaviors passed on from generation to generation, which was really interesting as well. I think that that brings us to a bit of a fairy tale theme almost. I, I don't think fairy tales really work unless there's something about the mother that yeah. generates the plot and, and propels the story forward. I think in stories where the mother is perfectly wonderful and a great mother and caring and loving and nurturing of her whole family, fairy tales don't develop. So I think this had a really strong fairy tale element of, of the mother's instigating, in some way mostly negative, the focus of the story. I would agree with that, although there were a lot of absent fathers as well, so no good parents for Kate Morton, apparently. <laughs> um, one thing, talking about fairy tales in the Forgotten Garden, there's a lovely section in the middle where um, Frances Hodgson Burnett, who is most well known for The Secret Garden, um, appears at this beautiful manor, um, and she talks about the garden, and there's a, a clue that it inspired The Secret Garden, and I think the way that Kate Morton writes about gardens and the countryside and all of that reminded me of that, so that was a really clever little gift to the reader. It well. was. It was a really nice surprise. A here into the story walks a real person and makes the whole story even that much more real and, and believable, um, and the fact that the main character in the book becomes friends with, with her is and takes her story and the whole idea of the secret garden forward it makes it even more special, I think. Yeah, it was a nice little treat for me reading at 3 o'clock in the morning when I couldn't put it down. <laughs> the other thing I loved about the Forgotten Garden was the English setting. Mm -hmm. The setting in London where the main character and her brother live in complete squalor in a, in a attic apartment with a small little slit of a window, the only way they can get fresh air, and and actually see anything, and the creepy family that lives downstairs that forces them to, to pay rent that's far more than they actually have. And then the creepy landlady downstairs comes back and betrays her later on, which is also a, a really fascinating look at English society at the time. The haves and the have-nots were so, was such a prevalent theme throughout the book. And then contrasted with the beautiful countryside manners, which are in both of those books. Yeah. Um, which there's a, a little bit of a sad sort of longing for that. Again, that sort of lifestyle doesn't exist anymore. And, and those characters are also dealing with it in both of them. But it makes you think of those sort of long sweeping costume dramas as well. Yeah. Long banisters in the secret ballrooms and the secret gardens and secret closets and all that stuff is all those lo things you love. Sort of, they all show up in the books, both of them, I thought. That make the story so rich. Mm -hmm. And speaking of bygone eras, the thing about the House of Riverton that I really liked too was that whole small little time that was the Edwardian era. And then once the First World War came, everything became a level playing field. And, and servants who had had that below stairs whole society and were proud of what they did and took real, real pride in being part of the family unit, even though they were actually servants, uh, once the First World War came and some of these servants went to fight alongside the highborn sons of the manor, all of a sudden it dawned on them that perhaps being a servant was not the most important thing to aspire to, and the whole Edwardian era died. Such yeah. a, an interesting small little time in history to take a look at, and I don't think there are that many books that actually talk about the Edwardian era that are written today, so I think that's something really special about that book too. And there's also the little hint of sort of what was going on in Paris post First World War and a bit of the jazz scene as some of the characters sort of get into that um, 
the artistic scene that was burgeoning then too, which was new and fresh and, and also a result of sort of having their whole world upset and sort of where do you go from there? And that's where they went. And yeah. So you get a lot of a lot of glimpses of interesting pieces yeah. of history. And family, I think, is another big theme in both the books. In the House of Riverton, it's a sense of family. Don't want to spoil the plot for anyone. It's a sense of family that wins out in the end. And that was a surprise twist that um, was very enjoyable in the book. And in The Forgotten Garden, too, it's the thread of family that, that takes the characters from Australia to England and back again. And um, the little... The little nuances that have to do with family members that are long gone in the Forgotten Garden was really interesting too. So the importance of family and how you almost can't leave your family even if you want to. Right. And I think, I, I can't recall another book that I've read where the twist was literally on the very last page, which is something that happens in the House of Riverton. And the twist, well there are many twists in both of them, but in the Forgotten Garden as well, right up until the very end. There's not necessarily a sense of Sometimes you end and then you have a chapter or two of epilogue or, or cleaning up. You never know what's going to happen until the very end no, in both true. of those novels, which is a feat. Really. Yeah, that's true. Um, the other thing that I liked about The Forgotten Garden, too, was the whole idea of the landscape in the, on the coast of England. That's a particularly favorite um, setting that I really enjoy reading about, and the whole idea of the garden and, and the garden being overgrown, and that being a metaphor for reawakening life as well was a beautiful aspect of that book particularly when the love interest was also interested in the garden and together they created their own love story and brought the garden back to a, the beautiful place that it started off to be yeah no, again very well done so I wonder what our new book is going to be about well I think I remember something about the second world war which makes me very excited um, so we'll have to see <laughs>